On behalf of the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation, thank you for being here. This is our uh, distinguished lecture series, and we are so honored to have Katya Wendt uh, being our distinguished speaker today. Just a quick note on housekeeping. We try to keep all of our events as low waste, zero waste as possible. Everything that you have uh, in your lap right now that you're eating, including your utensils, are compostables. So please, I encourage you to use our compostable trash bins in the back left corner of the room to make sure that we leave uh, as zero trace as possible uh, behind. All right, so that out of the way. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Tachik. I'm the executive director here at the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation, and uh, we're honored to have Katya speak with us today. <clears throat> so in case you're unfamiliar with the Scott Institute, we serve as sort of the campus hub of all things energy at the university. We bring over 160 different faculty affiliates from across campus working in a variety of different disciplines to solve big challenges in energy. Uh, each year, we provide seed funding to grow new clean energy research. We provide support for uh, new energy research initiatives. So as you might imagine, with campus being as large relatively as it is, uh, we have people in different pockets of the university. We need to make sure that they have the support and the touch point to meet uh, on a regular basis and form new collaborations, even if they're all across campus in different departments. Uh, we also provide support for energy startups. And lastly, we host many uh, energy-themed events, such as the distinguished lecture you are at today. At the end of the day, what we truly care about is accelerating the future towards a more sustainable future through the development of technologies, policies, uh, <clears throat> technologies and policies that lead to that more uh, low-carbon energy future. So if you aren't yet signed up for our newsletter, we encourage you to do so. Uh, it is our, uh, we, we share all of the exciting energy events and uh, activities and research and all of the exciting things happening at the university related to energy in this newsletter each month. Uh, we only email you once a month. Don't worry, we're not spamming your inboxes. We're not overcrowding things. But if you want to learn what, about more events like this and also many of the other exciting things happening, please stay in touch by signing up. And in case, uh, in case you're, again, new to the Scott Institute and you need to get in touch with us, email this email address. One of us on the team will get in touch with you. Um, we're also on LinkedIn and as well as uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, and uh, there's our website as well. So a quick note to students in the room, if you're interested in dabbling in entrepreneurship or, uh, or if you have a startup idea or if you have a patent or want to get into the energy business side of things, we are hosting the Energy Tech University Prize Regional Finals in February. What this is, is it's a collegiate competition uh, challenging students to develop uh, business proposals, business plans. So you don't have to have that, uh, that patent, that technology ready. You just need to have a good, sound business plan. And you compete with other schools around the country for over a quarter million dollars in cash prizes. So again, in February, we're hosting the regional finals. And the winner of those regional finals will go on to the final competition. Uh, we also wanted, this is the first time we were doing this, we wanted to recognize uh, a, the special group of students who we classify as our frequent flyers of these talks. Um, the students that you see on the screen here, well, including some faculty, we have Paul Salvador there as well. You are our frequent flyers and we wanna show that we appreciate you. So if you see your name on the screen now, uh, please stop and see Julianne at the front desk as you're leaving and you get a shiny, wonderful Wilton e. Scott Institute mug to keep your coffee or tea hot. So anyway, thanks for always being here. Thanks for your support. Uh, and now on to our main event. I wanted to uh, ask uh, a very special person to the Scott Institute uh, and one of our new leaders of the Scott Institute to introduce our speaker. She, Valerie Karplus, she's a professor in our engineering and public policy school. And she has been spending a lot of time in the past few years uh, helping to drive industrial decarbonization and help drive the future of manufacturing. So I wanted to give her the uh, opportunity to uh, introduce our speaker. And I should mention also, she has fancy new titles uh, with the Scott Institute. She is our new associate director as well as the acting director until our, uh, our, our future director, Costa Samaras, who is currently at the White House, returns in the spring. So uh, please, Valerie, join us in uh, introducing our speaker. Thank you, Daniel, and don't let those fancy titles fool you. I'm still very personable and excited to work with all of you um, across the board on a whole number of topics you're passionate about in energy. Uh, today, I'm going to keep this really short because I know Katya has a lot to say. Um, the metals industry, though, I think it's, you know, um, 
absolutely clear that the industries are facing challenges on multiple fronts, including automation, um, digitalization, as well as um, decarbonization, which is a big focus within the Scott Institute. And so in, in thinking that through, I can't think of a better person to come and talk to us uh, than Katya Wint, who is both uh, the executive leadership of the SMS group, but also near and dear to my heart, uh, has worked in academia before. And so I'll just give you a couple of highlights. She's the chief digital officer and member of the managing board of the SMS group, which is a global market leader in metallurgical plant engineering with headquarters in Dusseldorf in Germany. And around the world, the group has uh, 15,000 employees and generated sales of 3.1 billion euros in 2022. So this is no joke. Uh, she has um, her degree in me uh, mechanical, from uh, Leibniz University in Hannover in um, mechanical engineering. Um, and she's spent time at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, she's also she completed a doctorate in, um, in uh, the Institute for Production Systems and Logistics and um, has uh, you know, a, a number of academic credentials and awards. Uh, but I think perhaps um, what jumped out at me is the fact that um, she was actually the president in 2018 of Jakobs University in, in Bremen um, and helped oversee their successful restructuring. So um, she's a member of the German National Academy of Sciences and Engineering, um, as well as the National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina um, and the Board of Governors of Technion Israel. Uh, so um, really very active uh, in thought leadership as well as in industrial leadership as we move into the um, you know, industrialization uh, meets digitalization meets decarbonization era. So with that, I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you for joining us, Katya. Thank you, Valerie. Very kind introduction. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's really a pleasure for me to be back on campus and to, uh, to give you today a lecture, or let's say insights, in what we are doing at SMS Group in order to decarbonize uh, the steel industry. And that's why I also put uh, the title of the lecture, and that is, let me see, and that is actually Matters Industry Meets Data Science. And here you see already the combination of both. So we need the metallurgy part, we need also the process know-how, but we need to combine that with data sciences. And that's how we are going to decarbonize our steel industry. And Valerie already introduced uh, our SMS group, so I'm not going into each and every detail. Again, just one comment, and what you can see here is our investment in the future. This is our new campus in Mönchengladbach in Germany, um, but we are, of course, worldwide active. Uh, this is our headquarters there, and this is just under construction, so we are moving in uh, this, uh, this year at the beginning of next year. We are a company, and that was not so far said, uh, with a history of 150 years. So I think that's essential to know because we are within these 150 years in steel industry. And we are kind of invented, uh, the coke oven, uh, the blast furnace, and uh, all these technologies. Uh, and now we are coming in this next era of decarbonizing the metals industry, particularly the steel industry. So that is... Just in a nutshell, it looks so tiny, but it's, uh, this is our product portfolio. So what you can see here is coming here from the blast furnace and the cookery. You have uh, the caster plants and then down towards, it depends on what product you are looking at, long products or flat products. Well, we have then the phase of uh, hot rolling mill, cold rolling mill, um, everything else, processing lines. Um, this is served by us, so we are, we are uh, installing that in steel industry. And I don't know, I think you are familiar with that, but do you know how long is that? If, if you have an integrated steel mill, starting with a blast furnace towards here, the coil comes out, this is our customers are producing. How, how long is this in terms of length? Actually, I know this more in kilometers than in miles, but doesn't matter, right? It's about four kilometers. So it's, it's really big, right? So big size plants uh, we are talking here about. And, and that's what I just wanted to, pin, uh, to point out here. Um, that is the size we are producing in terms of what we are serving then for our customers. 
and as I said, we are combining this. And um, that's why we are, and this is one reason, but there are other reasons why we term as a technology company, not just someone who is just uh, serving the metals industry. Um, so we are combining this with digital know-how. And therefore, we build up a digital team. And you will later on see also Frank Ajobler here with me. Um, he will introduce you also to what we are doing there in terms of capstone projects. So later on, we can give you an overview, particular here for you students in the room, that you can, can participate in what we are really actively doing in practice. And what you can see is we built up, starting in 2019, a big team for digital experts, data scientists, data engineers, and so on, about 500 worldwide right now. And we have our headquarters in America's here in Pittsburgh. So and here's also a big team of digital experts. So both ways, either you are kind of more related to data sciences, but also with metallurgy, or even other topics around that, other fields uh, of study, you can ask us um, whether to join as an intern or later on also for thesis topics or capstone projects. I mean, those are the points we will, we will talk about later. I just summarized, I'm not going into detail here, what I think are learning questions you can ask you later on. Um, I know this may be now the topic really to ask for by a professor. But still for you, if you want to really take some <coughs> findings uh, with you, I mean, that's something I, I've just formulated. And here, this is um, how I uh, try to structure um, the presentation. And that is, first of all, part one. Uh, we are talking about also current challenges right now in the world, right? So what, what is that then valid for us and how we are looking on the manufacturing process and steel industry, how to decarbonize the metals industry, how to combine that with internal digitalization, and that leads us towards the autonomous plant. And that's something we are doing now currently. So we are installing autonomous plant. We will talk about that. What does it mean? Yeah, and um, up towards a kind of use case for slopping prevention, I will, I will look, honestly, I will look how far we can come. And I also like to invite you to post questions. So if you have questions, also meanwhile, just raise your hand so we can directly discuss it. And then I can see how far really <laughs> I can come to the use case or just keep it and then you can see it later on. Um, yeah, and then the part two is um, by Frank, uh, give you more details about these capstone topics where we integrate also real data from our customers and uh, where we can look on specific topics. And hopefully some of you can help us with that. Well, let me now come to the first topic. And this is about the challenges we are confronted with. Also, someone dealing as a global player in steel industry and with that we are actually, as equipment manufacturer for steel, aluminum, non-ferrous industry, we are the biggest ones in the world. Um, also with our service team, uh, because we are not just, deliver, deliver, um, uh, not just um, handing out our equipment, we are also looking for maintenance over a long-term partnership with our customers. And that's why we need also to take all the data with us. Um, here you see, actually, I think this is not new for you, the actual trends we are confronted with in the world. And there is, of course, a need for transformation, a need for, um, looking, for looking for how to relocate production, for example, from China because of what we have uh, now as a political situation. That's what we're now doing. We had these disruptive supply chains, and we are also relocating um, our supply chains out of China, for example, more towards India. So to be also more flexible in this regard to serve our customers. We are localizing a lot of capacities more locally in the world and regions. And this is not just us, also others are doing it, of course. And we are looking for alternative sourcings. And that also means alternative energy supply. We'll come to that later. Overall, one can say, because of these actual trends towards also reverse globalization, there is a demand <coughs> to decarbonize. And uh, we think that this decarbonization we have uh, confronted with all over the years already will lead us to a boom of technologies. And that, for us, is a new business case, of course. Yeah, so we are one of the only um, companies, or some of them, of course, there are others as well in the world. We can serve for the whole metals industry with these new technologies. But besides these global trends, of course, our customers are expecting 
maximum delivery performance, smaller order sizes, quality, minimum cost. That's, I think, a must uh, for all industry partners around the steel and, and, and metals industry. And that leads us towards turning data into value with our SMS digital. Yeah, so that means that we need to look on how can we further optimize along the whole value chain, not just decarbonize, plus digital topics, plus optimization in order to achieve higher, far, quicker <laughs> reaches of our customers, and to come towards via the, we call it learning steel plan, towards the autonomous plant. What this is about, we will talk, and I know that also research is ongoing here, so there's a good way also to collaborate on these topics. Let me now dive into decarbonization, what we think is uh, coming up in the future and where, where we stand right now. Um, clearly, there is a transition we are looking at. We are coming from, if you look over the uh, time span here, towards um, what we think looks it like to come to a full hydrogen, let's say, era, where we think this is more or less a target. But we are starting, obviously, now in our fossil-based era with CO2 production everywhere and so on. And we think just jumping from here to there might be a too big step, right? So not all technologies available. We have not energy, green energy everywhere and so on. So there is a transition phase where we think we need syn gases. And that is um, something I would like to show you why. And there are investment opportunities right now all over the world for it. And that comes towards, we have two main players in this regard, CO2 and hydrogen. And CO2, carbon dioxide, becomes a significant resource. Who has heard that before? Because uh, normally you hear that CO2 is kind of, we like to avoid, and now it becomes a resource. I will show you why. And actually, for hydrogen, we call it reduction agent or energy carrier. And that is because in steel industry, we are using it now instead of coke, right, to reduce iron ore. It's only with hydrogen then possible. And there are new technologies available. So for example, Climbergs or Swanter, just to name some, some, some companies here. So they are able to absorb CO2 and harvest it from the air. And we can also produce hydrogen by electrolyzers. So there are also different companies in the world able to do that. So now we are coming to what we are really also as a company trying to realize. And we have projects in the world already. And that is we call the industrial photosynthesis. What is that? Looking first on the natural photosynthesis, which is, I think, familiar to you all. So what happening? What is the tree doing? OK, the tree takes uh, CO2 out of the air. Sun is energy, and then water. And with that, tree is, is growing, so it produces wood, right? And what we are doing is we live from wood over whatever the last hundreds, millions of years, and take oil and gas out of that and burn it. So this is basically our fossil area where we are in right now. The industrial photosynthesis can do what, it, what the tree is doing right now, is able to uh, uh, replicate that. So we take green energy, of course, we need green energy, therefore. We do carbon capture out of the air. With that, we get CO2, we take water, and we put that in electrolysis. And if you put not just water, but also CO2 in there, you get out so-called syn gases, and that is CO and H2. And with that, we are entering the fossil-free base industry. I will show you how is that and why we are looking at that. So here, you see how we can run CO2 in a circle. This is also about uh, uh, recycling, or let's circular economy. So the, the, this is as follows. So you take CO2 out of the air with these uh, uh, CO2 capturing technologies. You take water. You put that, for example, in a high temperature electrolysis, quite Efficient because you do recuperation of energy by steam water. So by steam, uh, not just water. But anyhow, you get syn gases out and you take in a fissure drops. I don't know whether you know this is quite known, right? 
to produce e crude, and then the other refining procedure you come out with e diesel, e gasoline, e kerosene. And that you can do in an airplane, in a car, you can just take normal combustion engines, right? I mean, anyhow, for aviation, you need uh, e kerosene, we need sustainable aviation fuels, there's no other way around. So far, I think we'll just uh, H2 is coming later. And then it produces, of course, CO2, but you run CO2 in a circle. So you have no, no more CO2 in the air. Yeah, so you are taking it out and you are running it in a circle. So this is kind of circular economy. We are producing right now with North E oops, sorry. With North E fuel. This is a plant we are building right now in Norway uh, to have such an e-fuel plant ready. Because there is green energy available and so on. So, so that's something where new technologies comes into play. And where we think also one part of this transformation. Uh, from the fossil era towards hydrogen comes into play. Another topic of recycling, and that's what also we are doing. We are now building in Richmond a big recycling plant for Arubis, and that is about um, recycling electronic waste. And we, we, we call it also um, urban mining, because you can collect everything what you have in your household and you don't need anymore, and we can recycle that and get precious metals out again, all these precious metals. It's uh, based on pyrometallurgical plant or hydrometallurgical plant, so with CO2 or without CO2 emissions, but anyhow, the technology is there to do so. What we need, therefore, for all these topics, including steel or aluminum or whatever you are talking about, green energy, right? That's not enough right now available. Um, you know there are a lot of possibilities how to do that, wind farms, uh, solar power, um, shale gas, but then also there's another possibility. I just want to point it out briefly, not going into detail here. Um, but to recycle nuclear waste, you can use a so-called fluid, dual fluid reactor. Well, that's something also I know um, with the molten salt reactor, Bill Gates was also investing here. So there are new, now these dual fluid uh, salt reactors available at least the technology is there, and the first plants, let's say, uh, on a higher scale will be built now. And that enables us really to use waste of nuclear power plants and get a lot of energy again out of this. And after that, there's no more radiation coming out that you have to store it somewhere and close it uh, and uh, bring it in a whatever storage. That, that is something really new, and that's, uh, I think, another option for green energy. We are not in that, but this is another technology which I think will come up and will help us really to get enough green energy. Let me now come to the steel manufacturing process. Just a brief overview. I don't know who, uh, who are you really familiar with that. Um, it's quite simple, actually, uh, if you just look on an overall view and on most aggregated view. Um, you are starting with the melt shop um, for the, so you have uh, iron ore and then you produce out of that um, raw iron and then steel. And in the melt shop, you do the chemical composition for the different steel grades. So this is all the liquid phase. Then you do the continuous casting to get out, if it's a flat product, flat uh, um, slabs. And then you just, you just uh, have to make the slabs flatten. So you roll it, it's a rolling mill, hot rolling mill, cold mill, so really to make it even thinner. And then you do, uh, for example, continuous galvanizing line to have a certain uh, surface protection on it or coloring. So what you can see here is kind of different, let's say, quality problems you can observe within this procedure, be it scratches, be it... Um, Different uh, crowns, it's also another topic we can figure out on top of the surface of a coil in the end. Um, so there are different yeah, failures we can observe. And with that, we are entering the era that we would like to use digitalization to at least reduce the number of those coils who are then affected as a quality loss or have these kind of failures on it. And that's why we put here the digital 
processes. So what we are now modeling with uh, our digital expert will reduce failures and waste based on prediction. And if you have less waste, of course, you're also um, paying in the target of um, lower uh, CO2, right? Uh, emissions because with every reproduced coil, I mean, you are producing again. Uh, so this is another topic really to reduce CO2 emission. So that's key and that's something we are looking at and I will show you how we are doing that. So first of all, I think that could be known or can be known here in the room, uh, but how, how are, is decarbonizing ongoing in steel industry? The classical process is you have you have iron ore, uh, iron oxide. You use coke from the cokery and the blast furnace in order to come to big iron. That's a normal procedure. And now the new one is a direct reduction. You can either do with natural gas or hydrogen to come also to pick iron, to replace coke. That's now the new process in metals industry to decarbonize steel production at least at the very beginning. We are also looking along the whole value chain, but this is the first step, of course, and the most important one to reduce CO2 emissions in steel industry. So how does it look like? Just briefly, not going into detail in these equations. Um, but again, the original one, you have the iron ore, you have coke, and in the blast furnace, you come to two times uh, iron but also three times carbon dioxide. If you now start with a direct reduction procedure, in the first step, you can do this with a new technologies like a Medrex plant. This is one example, therefore. Um, you take natural gas, but you see already here, natural gas also gives up uh, three times uh, carbon dioxide, but eight times iron. So already the relationship is better. Next step would be, to replace completely coke by hydrogen. Nothing else than water. So that is really uh, the solution. And that is what we are also um, now installing at steel industry. And this is one example. This is, we call it H2 Green Steel in Sweden. So we are building a complete plant. It's a private investor in Sweden, completely private, no state in. It's for, uh, if, if you, you have the full scope of uh, this project, uh, it's five million ton uh, steel to produce and also quite uh, about five billion investments, euro investments. So you see it here in Boden in Sweden. So we are now in the engineering phase and um, also um, customers of that plant of the future. So automotive industry is also investing in that. So this is the first plant, uh, so it's really a revolution in steel industry, I have to say. Um, completely green, and it's a greenfield solution as well. So that's something which we are now currently within our, within, with, uh, with our engineers and the planning phase, and that will come out shortly. We have another one, it is ThyssenKrupp in, uh, in Duisburg in Germany. That's another topic, it's an integrated steel mill. It's an already existing mill. So where we install a Midrex um, plant uh, to decarbonize partly. And uh, first of all, they will take natural gas and then later on they will take hydrogen. But that is an existing steel plant. This is here completely new. So what are the, how, what, how, and what has this to do with uh, digitalization? And now let me just give a short introduction. Um, Quickly, because that's, that's not new, but I always ask the question, what's the difference between industry 3.0 and 4.0? Do you know that? Someone able to explain? Don't be so shy here in the room, but okay, I will do so. Um, so, I mean, 3.0 is known. I mean, if failure occurs, as I just explained on the surface, for example, on a coil, you don't would like to have as a steel producer. Yeah, the, the failure occurred, right? Okay, and then what you do if you recognize it, okay, you try to avoid it next time. So you do analysis and next time you try to have another parameter adaptation and then hopefully it's gone. Um, in industry 4.0 case, you try to avoid that failure occur. 
because you're predicting it first, and then you are readjusting directly the parameter setting so um, that you can avoid to have the failure. That's the logic difference in that. So that's why I'm talking about, um, first of all, we are looking at what happened. Then in industry, the diagnosis is so important. Why did it happen? And the next step is really predictive. What will happen? And the next step is preventive. How will we decide to avoid it directly within the process? So it's a constant prediction and prevention procedure we are trying to install also with our digital teams. And of course, you need, therefore, and we turn this data, um, uh, this circle here, but you can see a learning steel plant basis. So first of all, of course, um, you have to have the right data collection. You have the right data there in place. But you need also clearly domain know-how to interpret that rightly. I can tell you, I mean, with our data experts, and, and Frank knows this also, um, if they correlate everything with everything, and you take forever, <laughs> You cannot find the right correlations, maybe, right? So you need really to come up with the right uh, setup, which data you put into play, how to correlate what with which is each other, and therefore you need our experts from the process, from the domain know-how. That's sure, we have to team them up. And if you do so, of course, um, then you can further go to the database learning and deciding on it and looking whether you have the right correlation found. Yeah, and afterwards, of course, the improvement and skills is coming up, so how to avoid it. So that's a, that's a regular circle we are talking about. And here are some use cases we are using internally. We are using internally in our um, company uh, to set up such, um, such learning cycles also in our industry. And I would like just to jump into one. This is process automation. And here you see um, how we are dealing with that. Um, it's not just that we are trying to digitalize and autonomize everything in our company. but As we are doing that for our customers, we need to do this internally as well. Otherwise, we are not authentic. So, and here we are looking at, uh, first of all, do we have already a digitized process? And if yes, we are looking, is this really important problem or do we talking about nitty gritty? And if, if, we, if we say, yes, it's really important, is there already a solution existing? Yes, so then we are using the solution. Or is there already a standard software? Yes, we are using the standard software. If not, then we are looking at what solution can we offer? Can we do this uh, with, if this problem is really referring to quite complex way of doing it, uh, of handling it, a lot of data involved, then we may go for pattern recognition and looking for machine learning. If, if this is not the case, and if this is repetitive, then we're going for RPA, for robotics process automation. So there we have a team in our company looking for all these use cases, selecting and prioritizing them, and according to this, uh, let's say, decision tree model, so we are, we are going through all these cases and realizing them. Step by step, not all of course <laughs> together, but step by step. And what does it mean if we are looking, this is internally in our company, so how, what are we offering then to our customers? I already brought you this picture of the learning steel plant, right? And that is why it comes into play. We have the internal digitalization and the external one, and we have to combine both. This is why there is a Möbius uh, band here, you can see. And that has also to do with diversity, and we say that only with diversity we can come to innovation. Because data is already diverse, we need to integrate different perspectives, but we also want to have intercultural and gender diversity in our company, so we are really looking on that, particularly in these teams. And that comes towards the autonomous production, the autonomous steel plant. And this is for us key in the future to realize that. What is that about? First of all, you have a holistic perspective, yeah? So you're not, not just looking on one plant, you're looking for the overall picture. You're not just concentrating on one topic. You create, you have this creative combination of diverse data really to come up with prediction and prevention topics and each and every topic where it's really appropriate to put that in. You have self-optimized process control, feedback loops, and of course, you look not just for 
building and planning and, re and designing the steel plant, you're also looking on the entire life cycle, a long-term partnership we are looking at. Yeah, so this is where we put our maintenance people, our service people, um, on the on these uh, on the sides of our customers. So how does it look like in more, let's say, combined view in terms of uh, software? What we are offering. First of all, you have the assets here. So we are having all electric automation, usually under our umbrella, meaning all sensoric systems, all drives, all motors, and everything what's necessary to make a steel plant really working. So we are also um, integrating in a steel plant. Out of that, we get all the data, all the feedback, and we store that in a data factory. Data factory is key because in a data factory you restruct, you're structuring the data and with that you can come up with, um, with all these applications connected via a digital twin. Yeah, so this is more or less a platform for us right now but we always um, install digital twins uh, where we also try out first our electric automation procedures in order to really ensure that this is going to work on the construction side. So what, is, what are all these um, applications about? So first of all, you need to look that your asset, the plant is working and delivering maximum performance. So maximum yield. If you have maximum yield, you are then looking on the best quality to produce. That the plant is always in the right condition to produce best quality. And if you have best quality, you can come to the best production planning schedule, meaning that you are then scheduling according to the best um, positioning of orders, uh, according to the status of the, of the asset, um, or the orders for the customers. And if you have done that, so you can do predictive energy management, so this is all in a predictive way. You can also produce whenever the possible cheapest way of energy consumption uh, is uh, coming from the market and is visible for you, or in that way that you have uh, and can reduce a CO2 footprint. Both we are also offering, we are also offering these applications for energy and also the, all these uh, different applications you can see here in terms of software system, predictive software system solutions. Well, and then you close the loop and uh, get feedback here and to the electric automation and can directly then organize it in the plant. That's part of the, um, uh, the autonomous steel plant. And here you can just see our energy um, platform. Uh, this is a company uh, we acquired in Brazil for our digital experts. And we can up to, sorry, up to... Uh, 7% we can reduce energy costs and even higher efficiency. So with that also CO2 carbon footprint reduction. Yeah, and here you just see a picture how it looked like the autonomous plant. Um, customers of us, they have different plants in the world. And we can think that in one headquarter, you have different control rooms. And from here, you can steer and control all the plants uh, directly. And that's something we are also now working on so that we can offer that to our customers. Well, and that's, that brings me briefly towards um, what it's really about learning. What does it mean really um, to have the autonom autonomized or autonomous steel plant? So normally you have data, of course, you make out of data information, then you integrate in these information process know-how. And by doing that, you are coming to a learning process. Either on the one hand you say, no, this is not the information I need, I have to combine it with others, or maybe I don't have the right data now available, I need further data. In any case, you come to the learning steel plant and you integrate it along the whole value chain. And therefore, digitalization is so important and it enables this um, also profitable productivity in the end via the autonomous steel plant. That's why how we are doing it. And we are doing it along the whole value chain. We are not stopping. And I also have shown you that's why we are doing the recycling as well. Well, that has to come with theory models, first of all. So we have a lot of sophisticated models in math and physics. Rule-based models 
as an addition based on experience of customers. And now we're doing these advanced data-driven techniques. So we are using data out of the actual current processes and integrating our predictive solutions with that in our models. And that makes them even higher ads for the, um, or more sophisticated for these applications. So in that, I'm not going into detail, but we have these, we call it expert systems, where also our customers can kind of click and play, let's say, with the AI technologies. So we have a database behind that, um, specific uh, machine learning tools here. There are also non-scientists, non-data experts can use it. And this is really valued by our customers, so they can just put together the AI solutions and use it. So there are some examples here around for the blast furnace. I'm not going into detail right now, uh, but that's something we are offering. But I can give you, if I have some time more, yes, so maybe some minutes, I can show you one example how we are doing it. And that is tap hole extension, tap hole life extension. It's one use case. It's on an electric arc furnace uh, that you know what it's liquid, it's a, uh, you have liquid steel in. And if you, if you want to take out the steel, of course, you have this tap hole and sometimes it's blocked and that's bad, of course. So we, we'd like to um, um, optimize this. And how we are doing it, you can just see here. Um, first of all, we have a model behind, right? So you can see here signals we are tracking and uh, taking out of um, our sensoric systems. So we have a model behind uh, of hundreds of signals, what you can see here. And then um, we have a threshold where we know if, if one of those signals coming above this threshold uh, of one of those sensoric systems, um, well, this is already an alarm which we have to take into consideration. So the threshold is set. And there in this threshold, if this comes up, we detect, okay, a blockage will occur, right? And then there comes warnings. Model gives warnings in advance. And then of course it gives uh, some more, some more um, information about how high is the risk that a blockage will occur. And gives more information about the data behind it. And these are now individual parameters responsible for the blockage which may come up then in, the, in some minutes, some seconds, some hours. So and then also the operator can go into detail and see, okay, what do I need to now adapt? And we can also do this in an autonomous way. It's both, right? Sometimes not that clear why it come, why then really a blockage is going to happen. But then you can start also working on these inference and parameters. And with that, we could increase the open rate from 80 to over 95% at the customers. And that's really money behind. So with this model, just to let you know what we are doing and that's something you can help us working with because we need this correlation of different parameters to identify when such a situation of a possible blockage will occur. Yeah, and therefore we need, of course, data. We need a lot of data. And this is the levels we have installed in the electric and automation. Um, just to let you know, if we talk about level zero, this is about all the motors, drives, and so on. Level one is the basic automation. Level two is the models we are implementing in. Yeah, so uh, for example, for, so for, for these uh, blockages. And level three is production planning and control system. Everything above... Um, uh, above the uh, automation level, so quality management systems and so on. And here you can see how that, this is actually the learning steel plan we built one time in Osceola. Uh, so you see level one, level two, level three is now the automation, uh, the um, uh, production planning and control level. And then we have all these AI technologies above with predictive solutions and the data factory is connecting all of these. That's how we are doing that. And that is kind of what I term um, our IP, uh, our IP um, protection, because um, this is a level two actually. So if, if you look, it's just a, of course a quite a screenshot out of that. Um, a lot of parameters we are observing in the plant and there are 
thousands of it, right? So we have thousands of these parameters. I think in a hot volume there are 15,000 sensors or something like that. So you see they are connected in a way and they have different names on it and they are different among all these different plant types. So if you want to use those, you need to know for which, param which parameter stands for what is happening in which process. That's really tricky. And that's why I show this here. And that's why we have also put up on top of that the data factory so that we can handle that. And that we can offer that also for our customers. So now I'm, I'm just thinking of whether we need to step in the capstone project. I can just maybe briefly show you one example. And then I would like to invite Frank to give an overview of what you can do for us. Um, let me just jump into that directly. Um, that is um, for a blast oxygen furnace, a slopping prevention system um, we are installing for customers. And that, that implements or that implies a detection model, a prediction model, and a prevention model. And what is, uh, what is slopping? I think you know that maybe it's kind of, if you cook, it's just overboiling, right? <laughs> you can imagine the steel, not so good. Um, but it happens, right? So, and it's really a mess, and it costs a lot of money. So avoiding that is clearly a good, good solution. So how are we doing that? So first of all, you need, on the one hand, uh, you need, you need uh, static process data, you need dynamic process data, but also what we have installed there is, on the one hand, visual and audio detection, because it's hot, right? You cannot measure everything, so you need to have another model there. And then we want to have automated process adjustments in order to ensure to avoid this, really, right? Not then it takes time really to adjust parameters and so on, should be automatically. So what we are doing, first of all, is to make it visible when it's slopping really happening, to make it transparent, to look on how can we predict that and how can we adapt it. That's what we are doing along the whole side. This is industry 4.0. So now you can see here, this is the video now, and you see the current, there's a sound level and there's a visual system you can see. And that, that is a blast oxygen furnace. So you can see also here what's happening. Well, it starts, it starts, we can see a bit longer. There, normally you can hear noise. Now slopping starts, right? You can see it. And here we cannot hear noise now, but it doesn't matter. So we have noise and visual uh, combination. And that really looks like that. So um, if this is happening, it's really bad. So uh, we have both installed, we are observing it, and we are hearing, listening to the noise. So this is the current sound level here you can see with this line. And um, yeah, uh, well, not good. <laughs> and a big mess, of course. I will skip that. So yeah, this is, a, this is a combination of acoustic and visual monitoring. And how to deal with that is now fed in our system. That's something, for example, uh, maybe in another way, another application, but you can also develop with us. And if we do that and use it, we can reduce, in this example I just have shown to you, um, before that they had 2,300 slopping events per year, the customer, 2,300. And now we came down to 800, even though it's not zero, still working on that, but this is already a dramatic improvement, right? And that also gives savings uh, of uh, 900,000 uh, um, EBIT improvement per year, which is uh, close to a million, which is really great, I think, right? So you can really have a huge impact with that. And that does not just mean the negative consequences. I think they are clear. It's also worker safety, energy consumption, all these topics which are then affected in a positive way. So and what we really like to do is to have other business models in place. We would like to get paid by performance increase. So if you avoid that, we would like to get paid by every additional reduction of slopping, for example, and not just one time. So that's something we are looking at, and that's why we're coming from these conventional contracting towards subscription-based subscription with software systems, license-based, towards performance-based contracting. That's what we are aiming for, and where we see also the future. 
So overall, I can say for me in the future, it's important to have this uh, autonomous competence on AI and how to really realize Industry 4.0 in and these uh, autonomous plants. Um, so we need to have that as plant manufacturers. And on the other hand, the balance should be that also the degree of installed autonomy is really determining the future competitiveness of our customers. So in this case, steel or aluminum or non-ferrous industry. That's key. That's besides decarbonization, you have to combine both. And that's what we are offering to our customers. And with that, I would like just to quickly summarize what you have seen here so far. And of course, decarbonization is the main challenge, and we are really in that as a company, as SMS Group. Uh, digitalization will boost the profitability on top of that with AI, with artificial intelligence. And CO2 and H2, as I said, will be the essential resources for the industrial photosynthesis. This is one part of decarbonization for the transformation towards hydrogen era. And we need green energy, therefore. Again, digitalization is necessary also to reduce the carbon footprint in existing plants. And we need to do this internally as well. Otherwise, we are not authentic. That's why we're doing the whole digital transformation in our SMS group. That's something also interesting for you to see both sides, right, as students, if you would like to cooperate with us. Yeah, and the future is to realize autonomous plants in a decarbonized way. That's key. Yeah, and with that, I'd just like to show you one last slide on the lecture and then invite Frank to show you the capstone project. That's just one component of, of the plants uh, we are dealing with uh, in our service now, yeah, to do maintenance. So you see the size? <laughs> this is the normal size uh, of a product or of a component we are dealing with. And this is in our um, in production plant in Mönchengladbach. So, Frank, would you like to come and take over? Because we, we are now here for the second time and already identified together with the professors here some capstone project topics. And we would like to invite you also to join as students, if you would like to also be part of dealing with um, these real um, hands-on work, let's say, in combination with theory. So that's, I can think, uh, something Frank is now going to introduce you. Yeah, thank you. I have to test this one first. Ah, there we go. Yes. It's going in a good direction. Um, yeah, Frank Ajogli is my name. Uh, the, uh, general manager of engineering in our, uh, in our company uh, for the digital uh, uh, sub-company, I can call it, here in Pittsburgh. So I'm covering the, the region, uh, Americas. And as uh, our Katja said before, we are working on a lot of solutions uh, to support the, um, the overall vision of uh, SMS to provide the right uh, system to our customers. And uh, when I'm looking at uh, um, the, the way the industry is uh, evolving, um, years back, you go first to the mining, you get uh, um, uh, the, um, the, the input uh, material for the, the, the production of the liquid steel. And then you do your productions, you send to your customer out there for creating, for example, or to build uh, cars. And over time, the cars are also really much uh, mechanical elements, right? So what do we do when the car is broken? What do we do when we don't use the cars anymore? We have to use the, the old car, the broken car, in the process again for the, recy the recycling so that we don't really much damage the environment and so on. So it's this... Uh, Constellation, for example, is also one of the points that we are also focusing on to make sure that not just creating now the, the new technology using, for example, the hydrogen and so on, but how can we support um, the ongoing um, way how we produce classically and recycle the material so that we can really have the, um, the, the value for the customers and for the environment in general. Now, we are in, uh, in the department of... Uh, energy uh, innovation. So that's why we, we set up the project that we would like to work with you guys uh, um, and focusing on this area as well. I just want to give you one example. For example, right now we are 
working with uh, the material science and engineering department on a couple of uh, topics, and we have some few people here. Um, and they are also realizing that looking at our data, looking at the method we are using, we are really much a technology company. We are not just uh, a simple uh, <laughs> company providing some solution to the, uh, the customers out there, but we are really much behind uh, new technologies, new ideas, new solutions that we can use to improve the, pro the, the performance and also the, the productivity in the steel industry. So now here, for example, you can see um, uh, for the capstone project, and it's not just the capstone project, we want to do also some um, uh, thesis, for example, the master degree, and also all the possibility we have to support us. Um, here, for example, we are <coughs> talking about the, the, the AI-powered waste, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, heat. Uh, we hear before that our plant are really big plant, and everywhere there's an energy. Everywhere is a temperature that we are really much using for the production. How can we capture this energy that we are just throwing out? We are not even using them for barbecue right now. So we want to capture this energy and then rework this energy, refeed this energy to the plant so that we can reuse it. And not just the material we were looking at, but also during the production, we can recycle things. Yeah, so now by using, for example, some uh, nice uh, AI ways, uh, we can really much support these, uh, these topics as well. Um, yeah, the, how we can capture, for example, the fuel, uh, the, 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 the carbon. We hear very much that this is a focus of the new uh, plant we are building in Sweden and all the, We have to have the solutions. The solution are, the people are working on the solution for sure, but there are a lot of ideas, a lot of things we still have to work on. Even if you don't now go, for example, for the big tech companies to find the solutions, we can start with the student, for example, to start looking at what is possible. Some people, they don't have any idea, but they come sometime just with uh, questions that bring us, for example, to think really much how we can really use um, um, the, the simple ideas to create the, um, uh, the solution out there. Uh, the third one that I have here, and it's not just limited to the third one, right? So the optimization of the decarbonization process itself, it's also a topic there that is open, that we are looking people right now to, to, to support us with. So we have the technologies, we are applying the technology, but how to optimize the entire thing. So we have a lot of topics. We have a lot of um, areas that we need to cover, but with uh, even 400 people right now in our market or our region, we cannot do all. So we have to start with uh, cooperating with your departments uh, and then to get uh, uh, you guys involved in this process so that we can really find a solution for the people out there and support the environment. So in your team, a uh, lot of data experts uh, all over the world, we are over 500, uh, but they are in teams with the domain know-how people from the metallurgy side, for example, or from thread rolling. Rolling, and then we are really looking into detail. And there's each and every project really um, clear. It's not an open topic. It's really clear that there's data available, customers there. So, and then also we will install it. <laughs> so it's not just for for the shelf. Uh, so we really want to install it, and that makes it, I think, really interesting to see how this is going to work. Yeah. With that, thank you very much.